he basically said, y'all are fake. <laughs> it is what it is. How did I mess that up? <laughs> How many times have you... Rude. Oh. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Talk to Tally. My name is Tally. Welcome if you've never been here before. This is the segment on my channel where I speak about God. I have faith talks with you all and I share with you the word that the Lord has placed on my heart for this episode. So we are officially on episode 10. We have hit the double digits, y'all. So I'm very excited for this word, of course, and I say that every single time, but um, anytime the Lord moves in your life, of course, you're gonna be excited. And if you're not, I I'm, I'm gonna need you to, to get it together. Yeah, for the title for the word today, I don't know if people will be a fan of it, but uh, we'll let it be what it is. It is what it is. It is titled, When They Can't Believe, They Make an Excuse Not To. Oh, that one might burn a little. Without further ado, let's just get right into a prayer and then we will get started with the word. Father God, in this moment, Lord, I come before you as your child, Lord, just saying thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak your word, Lord, to share the word that you've placed on my heart. Father, in this moment, I ask you, Lord, to place a filter in front of my mouth. Let it be you speaking, God, all of you, none of me. Let it be a word, Lord, that flourishes and grows in the hearts of the ones under my voice at this moment, Lord. Let it be your Holy Spirit moving and encountering them in a special way, Lord, that is undeniable and unshakable, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We are going to begin with 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. And the word of the Lord is read in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I have the NIV version. It says, But these people, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, slander what they do not understand. And in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. That word is a lot. <laughs> the need at the moment to kind of break this down a little bit before we even get into the word it says but these like irrational animals creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed Ooh. slander what they do not understand and in their destruction they will be they too will be destroyed creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed mm. meaning if we follow our instincts instead of denying ourselves we are leading ourselves to our own destruction Wow. They slander what they do not understand, therefore creating some type of destruction. Slandering, causing destruction also leads them to their own destruction. It reminds me of the word where I heard a preacher say, I forgot who it was. They said, the devil can only bring you as far as he's been able to go. And the farthest he's gone is destruction. And so when you follow that, when you follow flesh like instinct and desire and sin, there's only one place that can lead you. It's like when people say that like drugs will only bring you to either jail or a grave. There's only one way this could really go. So this word for you today is a reminder that there is really no excuse not to believe in him. And the only excuse may be that you've never heard of him, like ever. The problem is, is that many of us don't even give him a chance in the first place. And actually what we do is instead, if we ever have had an encounter with the church, because I say the church specifically because people tend up messing God, um, up for others. And even some will say that they don't believe in God just due to an anger towards him. I mean, if you have some type of anger, that still means that you believe in him. Just saying. This just came to mind. It's really like when, <laughs> when I hear someone saying, I don't like this, but they've never tried it. It's like someone saying, I don't like pop tarts. They're not for me, but they've never actually tried them in the first place and actually gave them a fair shot. So how do you know that you don't like something? if you've never truly tried it and gone into it with like an open mind. The problem is a lot of us will get into this whole relationship with the Lord and we'll believe that this is a transactional relationship that we get into this relationship to receive something from it. God is not this celestial bellboy that when you call, he has to answer. He is our father, he is our creator and he deserves way more respect than that. I remember in nursing school, and I know I might be getting off on a tangent here, but I remember in nursing school when we were uh, studying psych patients, a big thing that we were taught was to never ask the question why. The question why can be a very big trigger for some psych patients because it'll lead them down a hole that we definitely don't want them to. And that's what I wanna encourage you guys with today is be purposeful in your intent, in your relationship with the Lord and in the things that you ask 
of the Lord. Because sometimes some of us ask why with the undertone and purpose to find or look for an excuse or a loophole to not do the said thing that we are told to do or to find a reason to not believe in God. It's not for the simple reason to just know the why. But what some people also tend to forget is that us as humans, for some reason, we have this pride about us that we think we have the right to know everything. We do, we do. Let's be honest about it. How many times have you... Rude. How many times have you asked yourself a question about the Lord and been like, well, why? I need to know this. You know how many of us are so prideful to say, well, if I don't know the answer to this about God, then I'm not gonna believe in him. That's literally like saying, well, God, you're not gonna have the privilege of me believing in you, creator of the universe, creator of me, if you don't tell me the answer to this little thing. Ew, it's literally like a child having a tantrum. And I know because I've done it. That's like saying to God, God, you owe me an explanation. You owe me something. <laughs> Excuse me, who are you? Can we just take a seat back? for a second and realize all the good that he's done for us, all the things that you do have to be thankful for to him, not to yourself, because so many of us like to say, I want this, I wanna manifest this in my life, I do this, I put in so much work, me, 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 it's always I, I, I. It's a selfish mindset. The fact that we have air to breathe, the fact that we have clothes, food, a shelter, love around you, a job, the opportunity to believe in something openly, free will. And then on top of that, you want to add in the fact that he has his eyes on you, the fact that he fights for you and defends you, the fact that you can see, hear, and walk, the fact that you're not dead. Need I go on? And I think what really tends to irk me sometimes is, and it's just my personal feeling, so don't mind this, but when it comes to the aspect of spirituality, a lot of people are very close-minded. And I understand we're very curious people, but to think that a bunch of hormones is what causes us to have the spirit, the personality that we have, it doesn't sit right with me. And so just in the aspect, just in the aspect of spirituality, we have truly limited our comprehension. We have truly limited truth to be only what we can fathom, only what we can comprehend, our human brains. Do y'all realize how small we are? That small. <laughs> like I think about it sometimes and when I have dreams or when I have these visions of things and then they come to pass, even if it's like, let's say six, seven years down the line, there's no coincidence in that. And that's happened to me numerous times where I will have a dream exactly of something and then it'll happen in real life, whether it's hours, days, years later. I met my step family via my mother's husband in a dream six years before I moved to where I am now. Wild. I saw the church I was in. I saw the person. I saw him say his name. That was one of my cousins. But And that's not just the first time. And we really think that there's not something greater. Y'all focusing too much on deja vu. I don't believe in that. I feel like I've been here. No, 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 no. I have been because God revealed it to me. What many tend to forget is that we are three parts. We are made in God's image. That's what the word says, that we are made in God's image. So therefore we are three parts. We are spirit, soul, and flesh, just as he is father, son, Holy Spirit. And while the two words are often used interchangeably, soul and spirit, the primary distinction, this is the definition I found, between soul and spirit in man is that the soul is the animate life or the seat of the senses, desires, affections, and appetites. The spirit is that part of us that connects us or fuses to connect to God. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't say that there, there is no God to connect to. Just saying. Remember that something came from something, not nothing from nothing. And order and design, that creative design of the earth, there was a designer. Order and design, it points to a creator. Your personality is the pattern of your spirit. Oof. It's also not a mistake. See, the Lord, the way he's so perfect. It's really funny too, because I was actually watching a word the other day of an apostle that came to preach at a church that I went to go check out. And she said it too. She's like, you think it's a coincidence that God speaks through nature? There are three elements that make up everything in this earth. Like, come on, solids, liquids, gas. Three, three is the number of divine perfection. Let me find my book, hold on. I have it up here. If I haven't shown you guys this before, I love this book. It's the number in scripture book. I don't know if you can, there you go. Um, by, who is it? E.W. Bullinger, Bullinger? Bullinger, Never mind. that's Bullinger, I don't know but let's read the number meaning. I love it. I do believe that numerology is a thing and that the Lord uses numbers uh, to give us signals and to give us messages. There's no coincidences in God, I'm telling you. So this writer, he breaks down all the numbers and all the times that they were seen in the Bible and what they can mean and all these other things. It's amazing. God's attributes are in three. Omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Three therefore stands for that is which solid, 
real, substantial, complete, and entire. It denotes divine perfection. Hence the number three points us to what is real, essential, perfect, substantial, complete, and divine. Woo! Lord. And remember, Jesus resurrected on the third day. Woo! It is finished. Lord, that word or phrase that is utilized to signify it is finished, which is what Jesus uttered when he was on the cross, it signifies that a deal has been made and that a debt has been paid. Coincidences that people think are coincidences, they're really not. They're divinely planned and orchestrated. Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever to observe all the words of this law. There will be things that we may not be able to understand or that God hasn't revealed to us. And one, it may be because one, it's not our business, or two, it's not yet our time to know. The Bible does say everything has its time. Remember that our thoughts are not his thoughts, our ways are not his ways. I'm not saying to not seek out knowledge of his word in research. He doesn't want his children to be stupid either. <laughs> he will teach you all the things that you need to know. But I don't want you to get discouraged either if you're trying so hard in this path and you feel like you're still not understanding because there are some things that we very well may not understand. So that's when we have to ask God for discernment. We have to ask God for this teaching. We have to ask him for the revelation of what that means. And if he doesn't answer, maybe it's just not the time yet. Or maybe it's just not meant for you to understand. There's lots of difficult questions that we have in this walk that a lot of people love to like trip Christians up with. Like, well, who created God? What about this one's wife when there was nobody else on earth? I don't know what history book y'all have read that has given you every single detail about what somebody ate for breakfast that morning. You are just looking for an excuse to disprove that he exists. I bet y'all didn't do that with other history books though. I'm just saying. Don't be mad at me. So therefore, I've also learned that my curiosity can also be destructive. I have learned to ask certain questions to not lead me towards destruction. Because I'm an overthinker, if there's an answer that I can't get to or find, because I'm sure plenty of other people, there's plenty of overthinkers on this planet. <laughs> if they haven't been able to find it yet, listen, I'm even less equipped, except the fact that I got God, amen. So if you wanna reveal it to me, amen, he will. But I have learned that there are probably just certain questions that I have to save until I meet him in heaven and can ask him then. And some people like to say that's blind faith. Well, if you don't know everything, it's blind faith. The evidence tells me it's not. It's not blind at all. The evidence supports his realness. The evidence supports who he said he is. And so if that's the case and he tells me that he is who he is, Jesus, I believe him. That also includes with things about my future. If I ask certain questions that are not yet for me to know, or I can't find the answer to yet, and if I examine my intention in wanting to know those things, maybe it's best I wait for that question. Because then I do this thing where I try to make up my own answer and construct these loopholes as a placeholder for an answer to satisfy the anxiety, which we rebuke in Jesus' mighty name. Some things, again, we are meant to know but it just may not be the time. It says so in his word in John 13, seven, it says, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. So if you're having issues with disbelief or you feel yourself going down that path, I urge you and encourage you to reconsider because I've been there. And then when I got to know who he really was and threw myself into it and gave him a real fair shot, it changed everything for me because I met a man. I'm talking about God. I'm not talking about no real man, you know? I met Jesus. And my life has never been the same. Y'all ever hear the saying, mother knows best? <laughs> God's like that. And this word is even for people that don't believe. God is your father. So how many times do your parents actually know what's best for you? Ooh, I feel like I'm talking to myself right now, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many times as a parent, for those that have children out there, you know that what you're doing for your child is in their best interest, but they can't yet comprehend that. How many times do you have to say no for the sugary snack because they have to eat healthy first? Or you make them apologize to a sibling after a fight, even if they don't want to, because you know that's in their best interest, that you sit them at the proper spot at the table, but it's because you know that the purpose of that is to actually give them something yummy for them to eat, something that they need, but they don't get it yet. Oof. Proverbs 3, 5 to 8, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In other words, um, in other Bibles, it says understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. 
Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Matthew 12, 24, it says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. That verse really just sums it up, to be, <laughs> to be honest. Do not rely on your own insight, because how many times have we actually been wrong? Lord. <sighs> Matthew 12, 24, it says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. The Pharisees, of course, the haters, they be haters. Oh my gosh, I can't stand them, Lord. Once again, they're claiming that Beelzebul was the reason of the miracles that Jesus was performing, which literally, it makes no sense. Jesus was casting out demons and then they said he is the prince of demons. That's, that's why he's able to cast them out. Make it make sense. Why would a demon cast out another demon? You don't make no sense. You're looking for an excuse to not believe. Lord, you're looking for an excuse to not follow him. You're looking for an excuse to not be obedient. Lord, 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 because you know who God is. I feel like that's the word for somebody. You know who God is. You know he's been calling you and you're giving him the runaround and you're choosing other things above him. None of my business. Anyways, I'm continuing. The thing that's really funny to me is the fact that they said this knowing I, I have this feeling <laughs> Deep down, the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. They knew that he was the Messiah, but because they couldn't fathom it in their own mind, they decided to say, I'm going to make every excuse to not believe that it was him. I don't want to get my hopes up because it sounds too good to be true that our savior is here. Lord, I don't want to get my hopes up and believe in him because I've waited for him for so long. He's here. All you have to do is believe in him. God, the reason he was able to cast them out, one is because he's Jesus. He is literally God. <laughs> Demons cannot hide in the presence of Jesus. Actually, they run up to him because they're guilty and they can't hide in front of him because nothing can be hidden from the Lord. He sees it all. Lord, Lord, Lord. And so Jesus said in response to the Pharisees that were questioning him and looking for an excuse to not believe in him. He said, Matthew 12, 25 to 28, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Ooh, he's being sarcastic. Ooh, and if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? Oh, oh shoot, and I, oh, and if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? Oh, so then they will be your judges. Oh shoot. Yo, Jesus is so spicy, y'all. Oh my gosh. He basically said, y'all are fake. <laughs> y'all are not who you say you are. And what, and what about it? Jesus had no problem embarrassing people in public. I'm telling you, it was crazy. I love it though. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And y'all still don't see that I'm right here. Y'all still don't believe in me. This is what I just, <laughs> this is what I don't get. I mean, I kind of get it because I used to not believe too, but we literally see the evidence of his existence. We literally see exactly who he is in everything on this earth, yet we choose not to. We turn a blind eye on purpose. And what's even crazier is the fact that they literally had Jesus in front of them, doing the miracles in front of them, physically. They saw it with their own eyes and they still chose to not believe. And I'm sure that there's people that now, today, if, if Jesus was walking on earth today, I'm sure that there would still be some type of Pharisees around that they would see him perform these miracles and they'd be like, oh, magic, <laughs> it's not real. So you're gonna tell me that people that get healed from being paralyzed their whole life and can walk and dance now, the ones that couldn't see their whole life, the ones that were demon possessed, people that were dead and he raised up. Come on, man. Blessed are those, this is what the word says, this is just coming to my head. Blessed are those who believe in me even if they don't see me. Because he, even one of his disciples, Thomas, this is coming to, Lord, thank you. Even his disciples, Thomas, doubted that he resurrected. Even one of his disciples, Thomas, they call him Doubting Thomas, which was also called Jesus' twin. He asked for proof that Jesus had resurrected. And he kind of came at him a little bit, Jesus said. He said to him, you have, he said something along the lines of, you have believed because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen yet still believe. Woo, Lord. Thomas said to Jesus, he said, unless I touch the wounds in his hands, Unless I put my finger through them, I will not believe that it's actually him. After Jesus appeared to them three days after resurrecting. In case you don't know the story, I'm sorry. I'm trying to catch you up here. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that even though he kind of like was like, hey, yo, you know better than this. He still gave him his hand and he still let Thomas put his finger through and touch the wound. That's how gracious and how merciful he is of us. People believe that historical figures 
existed at one point because of witness statements. But they look at Jesus and say, no, nope. oh, thank you. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, I guess your great, great, great grandparents didn't exist because I mean, I guess you didn't see any pictures of them and things like that. So that means that you're here um, by gusts of air. Get it together, Lord. Let me not get mad. I'm gonna get a holy anger coming through. Like if you think about it truly, if in a hundred years somebody looked back and said that you never existed, how messed up would that be? And how much of a lie would it be? Just because they don't see you doesn't mean that you never existed. Doesn't mean that you didn't live the life that you did. Doesn't mean that you didn't do the things that you did. But people do that with Jesus, so. I need you guys to take a second to pray, to ask God to help your unbelief. There was somebody in the word, I forgot who it was right now, that literally looked at Jesus and said, help my unbelief. That is something that you can do. You can ask the Lord and say, I don't know if I believe, but I want to. Show me you. Show me who you are. It's not from a place of feeling that you're better than. Like, prove it to me so I believe in you. Uh -uh. But say, Lord, I'm open. I'm open. I rebuke any doubt in Jesus' mighty name. Help my unbelief, Lord. And he will help you. What will it take? Have, have you still not been convinced? And this is why I say that a lot of people just don't want to believe. I remember somebody told me the other day that I was talking to them about the gospel, the good news that we preach about Jesus and how he died on the cross for our sins because we all are sinners. And this person looked at me and he said, I know God doesn't want anything to do with me. And it broke my heart. He's like, God doesn't want anything to do with me. I sold drugs as a teenager. I hurt people. I was in a gang. And it's funny because I looked right at him and I was like, it's funny because actually that's the exact type of person he'd be looking for. <laughs> he has no favorites. And he said he came to heal the sick. He came for the sinners, not the people that think that they're perfect. Lord, some people just can't fathom the goodness that we preach about, that there is a God, that he is real, and that he has forgiven all the bad that you've done, all the running away that you've done. And actually he's waiting for you with open arms. I thought he wasn't for me until I realized I was really sadly mistaken about a lot of things. Some may not want to believe because they don't see themselves as worthy. Is Jesus dying on the cross for you not proof enough that he finds you to be worthy of his love? or some, like I said, maybe prideful. They want to avoid giving God the glory of everything that's happened in their life because they want that applause. They want that cheer up. And a lot of us really think that we are the ones that have the final say. You may have free will, but you don't have the final say. Whoa, Lord. And that's why so many people, they want that cheer. They want that audience and the applause and they want to build themselves up to make themselves their own God. As I've already preached about, I don't even know how many times on this platform. And the reason is, is because the enemy, that's exactly what he wants from us. He could never be God. So he makes his children believe that they can be. It was something that was inherited. Ooh, y'all, it's getting dark. It's about to rain soon. Don't mind the light changes. <laughs> and that's the thing, it's so funny because the enemy can no longer rebel against God because God no longer claims him as his. The enemy can no longer be a, re a rebellious son against God. And you can only rebel against someone superior to you. Because he thought he could be superior to God, God let him go. And the chance that he was supposed to get. Now we get. He gave it to us. And isn't it so funny that a lot of people actually believe in the devil, but not God. A rebel is a person who rises in opposition or armed resistance against an established government or ruler, like the parents in a house. I'm going to read this to you so we can finish up. It says, Romans 1, 18 to 21, it says, God's wrath against sinful humanity. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but for their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. There is no excuse to not believe in God, none. You know, I personally have seen atheists believe in only the power of the universe and energy and vibes. <laughs> and at one point I used to too, but it wasn't because I didn't believe in God. It was because I was trying really hard not to actually. I was running from my belief in him, Ooh, Lord. But if you want to stay worshiping less, if you want to stay worshiping the creation and not the creator, then do you boo boo. I worship the living God that allows those things to exist. A lot of people want me to sit here, right? With all the love that I have in my heart, I know I realize that this may be a word that 
really rubs, rubs people the wrong way and it may seem like I'm judging and things like that and whatever. You know what? So be it. I'm gonna get attacked anyway, probably. And if I'm offending anybody, I truly, I don't mean to. I think we live in a world that a lot of people will say, let everybody just believe their own thing. Let everybody just have their own beliefs and we respect them and continue on. I respect your decision to make the choice that you have made. I respect the fact that you have free will to make that decision. But what I will not do is sit here and agree and say, yeah, everything is right. Everything is valid. There's so many ways to get to heaven because Jesus says he is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to enter the kingdom of God. So if you don't believe in him as the Messiah, as God, as he said, if you don't believe who he says he is, then that's your only way in. I would be incredibly hateful to not share the truth that I have found because every religion is a truth claim, but out of all of them, he is the one that is mentioned by basically almost all of them. He is respected in all of them. And he's the one that's been consistent in every single thing that he has said. He is the one that has fulfilled hundreds of messianic prophecies. He is the one that has never failed and has done everything that he said he was going to do. He is the one that thousands of witnesses have written about. And this is not just in the Bible. This is also in historical texts, like news articles type thing, journals. He is the only one that is still alive and speaking to this day. So I have no problem proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11:3 it says by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Jeremiah 8:1 to 3 it says at that time declares the Lord the bones of the kings and officials of Judah the bones of the priests and prophets and the bones of the people of Jerusalem will be removed from their graves. They will be exposed to the sun and the moon and all the stars of the heavens, which they have loved and served in which they have followed and consulted and worshiped. They will not be gathered up or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. Wherever I banish them, all the survivors of this evil nation will prefer death to life, declares the Lord Almighty. These people were disobedient. They put other gods before the one true living God. They praise the sun, moon, the stars, other things that were man created. What a disrespect, but that's not for me to judge. That's God's job, not me. My job is to love you anyway and talk to you about the truth. They put these things before God. And it doesn't necessarily mean, listen, some people think that something has to be first in first place to be an idol. Some people think just cause it's a second or third priority. It's not really like you're, you know, idolizing it. No, no, no. If you put it before God as number one in your life, it is an idol. And it is another God that you were creating that you were worshiping. It could be money. It could be sex. It could be makeup, clothes, vacations, oop, food. Anything that comes before your prioritization of your relationship with the Lord is a God. Because first and foremost, number one position should always be God in your life. So if you put any of these things in your life on a pedestal and higher than they should be, because we even make even the most minuscule things higher than they should be, it's still a form of idolatry. And these people kept on getting warning after warning from the Lord until God said, okay, you've made your choice. I didn't make it for you, you made it. You have all this joy and gladness in your rebellion and in your sin. I've already told you it will lead to your death. Spiritual for sure, physical likely. So since you have already chosen over me, because I've given you enough free will because I'm not a dictator. I'm going to give you the free will to choose. But trust me, I've carved out the best path for you, but you have chosen. So if, since you have chosen, let's make your destination just happen sooner. It's unfortunate. This is your last reminder and we close out with this. Romans 1.20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see the invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. I had to read that verse twice because <laughs> that's the whole basis of this word. There is no excuse. There's no excuse. So do your best to not search for an excuse to not believe in him. Fear of the Lord is not this fear of shaking in your boots and which definitely can happen because I don't want to be on God's bad side. I don't want to see him when he's angry. Absolutely not. If you read the Old Testament, you'll know why. But what it's talking about is genuine reverence and respect for him, for everything that he's done, will continue to do. He loves you. He's calling you. And your life wasn't created without a purpose behind it. I love you all. And I hope you receive this word with all the love and care I could possibly give to another brother or sister in Christ. Because it is truth. Undiluted truth. And that may be uncomfortable for some. Let's pray. And I'm gonna let y'all go. <laughs> 
Father God, I come before you in this moment as your child, Lord. I ask you for the person across the screen under the sound of my voice in this moment, Father God. I ask that you have an experience, Lord, an encounter with them that is undeniable and unshakable. May they run away from their disbelief in you, Lord, and not from you any longer, Father God. I ask you in this moment that it be you softening their hearts and opening their minds to your realness that they experience the realness of who you are, Father. Let it be you, Lord, changing minds, opening them, and shutting doors on the works of the enemy in Jesus' mighty name. Call your children home, Father, because the time is coming, because Jesus is coming soon and our time is running out, Father. Have mercy on us, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, Father. Let it be you, Lord, touching every single person. May their gaze be turned to you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. It is getting dark and there is about to be a storm, y'all. So I apologize about how dark it got, but thank you all for spending time with me today. And I will see you guys in the next one.